Hey, um, I am having, I think, technical difficulties. Um, I, I imagine it says I have a few viewers here, so I think that means that everybody can see me. And just give me one second. I promise I'm going to fix this. I think it's because... Uh, I'm not sure why, actually, but it'll just be one second. Live, yes, okay, good, good. Okay, um, I believe, hey, Holly, Gallimore, hello. There is like a delay, so what, so I guess like right now as I speak, you guys are seeing me, um, whatever. Okay, let's start. Thank you very much for coming. Um, I am going to be giving away a few things here um, at the end of this broadcast, which will be in like uh, 30 minutes or so. I'm going to stay here for like 30 minutes. What you guys can do is um, please feel free to leave comments on the side. Uh, there's a chat box on the side of the channel here, and I will be glad to answer them. Um, in about 15 minutes, I'm going to start doing all of the telephone calls. If you would like me to call you, please email me your phone number, um, and I will call you myself in just a few minutes. Um, I've just entered my email address into the comments, so um, yeah, uh, that is where you should email me your phone number, and I'll call you momentarily. So, um, I was going to start with the questions that people had about writing advice, because I feel like that is something that um, a lot of people starting out, like, they're really frustrated. Like, I know I was really frustrated and lost a lot of the time. So I am... Uh, I, I think that the biggest thing I wish I had known when I was starting out writing is that it's always hard. It's hard for everyone. There's nothing wrong with you if you're uh, having a hard time. Uh, and, and I think that the most useful advice uh, that I could give is that when you're first starting out, don't worry as much about finding an agent, about how to get published. Like, that's exciting stuff, and it's cool to look forward to getting an agent and all that stuff. Um, hello? Jessica Reed, hello. Um, but the thing you really need to focus on is just becoming awesome, like getting really, really good at writing. Um, and the way you do that is you have to read a lot and you have to write a lot. I think Stephen King said that if you can't, um, if you don't have time to read a lot and write a lot, then you don't have time to become a writer, which sounds kind of harsh, but I think it's true. Uh, I think that also you have to really read and write what you actually love. Like, I guess right now the big trend in young adult publishing is dystopian stuff. Although I... I suppose that trend is ending as well. Don't write dystopian stuff because you think it'll sell. Um, and Or if you like, um, like if the next trend in young adult fiction is like jetpack wearing ninja girls or something, don't actually like write that unless you love it. Because writing itself is so hard and so lonely and takes such a long time that you really um, won't be able to get through it unless you uh, are really in love with the genre and really loving the process. I'm going to leave a couple comments. Um, like I said, feel free to also email me or to uh, leave questions in the comments section here. And if you would like me to call you, please email me at tmichaelmartinbooks at gmail.com. 
And when we get to the phone call part of the broadcast, which will be in about 15 minutes, I will call you, uh, and you'll be able to ask a question live if for some reason you would like to talk to me and hear my strange voice on your phone. All right. And just so you know, uh, uh, there is like a delay. Um, I think it's about a 30 second delay. So I'm seeing your comments automatically, but then I'm you're not seeing me responding for like 30 seconds. That's why. Okay. Uh, and for anybody who's still just coming in, I'm going to be doing uh, like a giveaway at the end of this broadcast, and it's going to end at about 12:30 or 12:45 or so. Um, so, well, I guess that's my time. So in about 35 minutes, it'll be over, and I will give you information about how to win some free stuff. Uh, the next thing I was going to answer was um, somebody who was really nice, and they asked a few questions. They said, did I expect the end games to get the kind of response it did? I think the end games has been doing better than... Um, I could have like reasonably expected because even though I started writing the book in like 2008 before like zombie stuff was super big and there was a lot of zombie projects, I um, like by the time I finished it in late 2011 and HarperCollins bought it, there was kind of a lot of zombie stuff out there already, which meant that um, it was going to be harder to break out with the book or to like you know, get some attention for the book. But um, early on, uh, a lot of authors were really supportive of the book, like Sarah Zar, R.L. Stein, Pitticus Lore, um, lots of different people. And that was really great. And then the first review that came out from Booklist was really, like, generous and lovely. And I think that the biggest reason the book has been um, doing pretty well, and I think, like, outpacing almost everyone's expectations, is that... Uh, like you guys, I mean, honestly, like the YouTube community has been amazing in uh, supporting the book, and like it, it's it's really been kind of a creative uh, revival for me personally because I uh, find it's writing. I really love writing, but it's also such a lonely job that it's it's kind of like hard to meet new people sometimes. And uh, let me just answer this. I've really loved being able to like interact with you guys. That's been the most exciting thing that has happened to me in this uh, last year. Like even more than getting my book published, was uh, getting to know you guys and also like getting to know. Um, let me just answer this. Getting to know like Elmify and uh, Briarly Bishop and Christina Horner and like a lot of my. Uh, favorite YouTubers. Rosiana is amazing. Um, it's really cool to be able to become friends with your heroes. So yeah, that was an incredibly long answer to a very short question. I didn't expect the end games to do as well as it's been doing. Um, I don't think anybody expected it, but the YouTube community has been so supportive, and I think word of mouth has been pretty good, so it's been doing well, and mwah, thank you. Uh, what is the hardest part of writing? The hardest part for me is figuring out what the book is really about. Like, what is the emotional part of the book about, and what are the themes of the book? Because for me, I never know how to structure a book unless I know what it's about thematically. You know, like, it, um, like the end games, for me, it's kind of about, it, emotionally, it's about the brothers and the question of whether you can protect innocence during a chaotic event, uh, but thematically, I really wanted to explore, like, the pain and miracle of ambiguity and of accepting that you can't control everything. Like, the main character, Michael, his flaw, his, he's got a few, but, like, his major flaw is that in his quest to keep his brother safe, he convinces himself that he can do that. Like, that not just keep him safe, but almost create a pain-free world for him. And I think that's something, like, a lot of parents go through. I'm not a parent, but um, I've had, like, a lot of adult readers say that to me, that they didn't relate to it as a sibling, but as a parent. Um, 
And so that was once I figured that that's what the book was really about. That was a lot better. Like I, I had a better grip on the book. Um, and the other part that is the hardest thing for me in writing is letting go of perfectionism and also the desire to please everyone. Like I, um, I want to have the like I want to have as many people read my book as possible. Not like for financial reasons. Well, I guess partly for that, but not like mainly for that. I just really like the idea of a lot of people reading what I write, and um, so I want to please everyone. Like I write very much with the audience in mind. Although the books I do write are like very personal for me, and they mean a lot to me. I'm like I'm a I'm a, I'm a I am myself a product and lover of pop culture, and uh, so like realizing I can't actually please everyone, and then if I try to please everyone, I will please no one. Um, that is a particularly difficult thing for me because I, um, I just, I, I like when people like what I do, and I write it for them, you know? Uh, what, who are my biggest influences in my writing style? Right, so my biggest influence for my, like, the actual way I make sentences is this man named William Goldman. And you guys have probably not heard of him. He's not a famous novelist by any means, but um, he's more famous as a screenwriter. He uh, wrote, like, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, but, uh, but you probably have heard of his biggest book, which was uh, The Princess Bride. And he wrote a bunch of uh, thrillers in the 70s, like Marathon Man and Magic and this other one called Heat which were stylistically, they just read like lightning storms. And I really wanted to have that feeling in my own writing. So that's, he's the biggest. And then John Green, obviously, and Stephen King, Cormac McCarthy, and my friend Sarah Czar, who was my first really like serious writing mentor in publishing. And she was also like a very, very good friend. Okay, so you've, if you guys have any questions over here in the comments, like, Continue to please let me know. I'm going to check my email and see if I have any phone numbers. I have not received any phone numbers yet. That's all right. That's all right. Uh, let me know if you would like me to call you. I will be more than happy to do so. tmichaelmartinbooks at gmail.com. Uh, hello, Elliot. Good to see you here. I'm really glad you could make it. I don't usually read zombie stuff, but I think you have originality within the zombie world on your side, so I think that probably helps. Thank you very much. Yeah, I never thought of the end games as a zombie book. And, like, when I talked to my agent and editor, I was like, I know people are going to say it's a zombie book, but I always thought of it as a psychological thriller that happened to have zombies in it, and arguably the zombies are not even the biggest threat in the book, because there's the emotional threat of Patrick, you know, freaking, and then there's the uh, very tangible, violent threat of Captain Joe Peck. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. I, I, I worked very hard to create some kind of... like, to do a different kind of zombie story, although I really love zombie stories. Okay, next up. Um... So I answered a little bit about being an aspiring writer. Uh, I think that the other thing, there are a couple books that you should read if you're an aspiring writer. I really like um, Robert McKee's book. It's called Story. Uh, that was like a really, really helpful book for me to read pretty early on. The other book that I really loved um, and it was very helpful was a book called Screenplay by Sid Field. I'll go ahead and type these in the comments. Um, Creation and story by Robert McKee and screenplay by Sid Field. Okay. Um, yeah, read those books. It's, they're really, really helpful in terms of how to structure a story. Uh, is there going to be a sequel to the end games? No. 
I really don't think I will ever write a sequel. Um, the book I'm working on and I'm going to finish in the next few weeks, months, probably like two months, is not a sequel to the end games. It has nothing to do with it. It's, uh, it's a completely different world. It takes place in a, uh, like, Earth, like, regular high school setting. It's not post-apocalyptic, no bellows, and no other... There's no, no relationship uh, with the end games. And that's partly, um, it's like, some people have said that the end games has, like, an open ending. Like, it seemed like I was trying to set up things for the sequel. Uh, that, admittedly, like, not very many people have said that, but I never, um, that wasn't my intention at all. I just wanted to give just enough emotional closure, if not total dramatic explanation, to, like, let the reader come up with their own ending or, um, you know, uh, decide for themselves who is on the other end of that walkie-talkie broadcast. Uh, so, um, yeah, there, I don't want to write a sequel also because, like, one, I do not know what happens after that. I have no idea. Um, and two, um, the book is kind of about uh, the attempt and inability to write, like, or to... Um, know for sure what's going to happen next in life, and I wanted that uh, to be an emotional experience for the reader as well, if that makes sense. So I, 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 I didn't want to close the story because I don't think that that... Like, that's not a, a, my experience of life. Um, the book is really about... And Stevie Finnegan, who is um, Sable Cot, it's S-A-B-L-E Cot, C-A-U-C-H-T, um, She's amazing. She's like a genius. I think she goes to Oxford. Uh, she's a really great YouTuber that you guys should check out. And she gave one of my favorite reviews of the end games. And she said that the book is about the narrativization of life. And I think and what she meant by that is that it is about how we, we tell ourselves stories to try to make sense of the world. And uh, I think most of those stories, unless we have a very flexible psychology, can um, be insufficient in terms of helping us through our encounters with life. They're not complex enough. Um, they speak in absolutes too much. So I didn't want to show <laughs> what happens to Michael and Patrick because I didn't, because I don't know, and I don't know what will happen to them. I don't know if they're going to be safe. Um, I don't know if it's like really the army on the other end of the broadcast, but I do think so. I do believe that there is a, uh, the army on the other end of that broadcast, and I think that they'll see their mom again if she made it, but I don't want to say for sure. I don't know. What do you, let me know what you guys think. Like, what do you think happens after the end of the book? What have you thought about? Let me know in the comments, and I'll be able to see those. Um, okay, the other thing that people were asking about uh, with, like, the book the book's themes and the ending of the book. What is the book saying about Christianity and about uh, religion in general? There was one review, and I was really glad, because I've read, like, a couple hundred reviews for the end games, um, and only one review said this. So one review said, um, why does T. Michael Martin hate Christians? Like, why is he trying to show the rapture as crazy Christian people? I don't hate Christianity at all. Like, um, I don't speak about my own religious beliefs because it's, like, very personal, but I certainly um, have a very, uh, like, I was a religion major, and I, was a, I double majored in religious studies and English before I transferred to film school. So, uh, w again, what I wanted the rapture to show, and Ruan in particular, is uh, the danger of having an inflexible psychology. Um, and Ruan is driven mad because he cannot come up with a story that makes sense of this terrible tragedy that happens to Katie Gibson. That drives him crazy. And that, uh, I think that that is what happens when people have like, very strict dogmatic beliefs rather than um, beliefs that are a little bit more complex because um, sometimes the world... It, it, 
life is so chaotic sometimes that it, it can be difficult to feel that very, very strict dogmatic beliefs uh, are sufficient or um, they're kind of in alignment with the things that happen in the world. Excuse me one second. I am going to check the comments and answer you guys in some text form. Okay. I'm feeling too shy and I'm not looking so crash hot. <laughs> so crash hot? Is that like a, is that a phrase? Is that like a, an actual phrase? Um, let me know, because I really like that. Uh, Becky Snowball, who has the best name ever, by the way, can we agree? I agree, so that's enough. Becky Snowball, hey, what is your favorite fiction book, and who or what inspired your writings the most? I think my favorite book of all time, uh, my favorite novel, is The Stand by Stephen King, and if there had not been a The Stand, like, there would certainly be no end games, and I also don't think there would be, like, like, this television show Lost couldn't exist, and almost, like, no post-apocalyptic book could, like, as we know it right now, could exist, or at least not in the same form, because that is really kind of the... I wouldn't say it's the granddaddy. I would say the the, the great-granddaddy is this book called Day of the Triffids. The granddaddy is I Am Legend, but the father of the modern post-apocalyptic story is The Stand. I find it like a beautifully spiritual book um, and a very compelling read. And it also kind of reflects my... Um, I feel like the God, the representation of God in The Stand and the God in The End Games, it, I feel like it's, it's pretty similar. Um, what's, and, I, and also, I feel like the both gods both representation of God, and, you know, they're arguably Christian or Judeo-Christian gods. Um, it's really the same voice that spoke to Job out of the whirlwind. You know, Job said, I want answers. God said, that's too freaking bad. Um, and what, who or what inspired your writing most? Definitely Stephen King, uh, R.L. Stein. And then the reason I started writing YA, uh, it was, I read... Looking for Alaska by John Green and Story of a Girl by Sarah Zar. And the fact that they've been both so like supportive of the book and really liking the book, that's been pretty amazing to me. Uh, Mike, this is from Claire. As an artist, can you speak to the importance of being part of a creative community? That is a really good question. Uh, my wife and I recently moved back to West Virginia. We were going to stay for like a year. Uh, we've been living a couple states away, and we moved back to be closer to family here. And that was the hardest thing about coming back, was that there was really not a creative community in the same way that there was uh, where we lived in North Carolina, which was Winston-Salem. Not a major city, but still a city. And here it was like, uh, it was quite different. Like, I was kind of a strange, strange bird here. Uh, and so I... I one thing that YouTube has given me is that it, it is like I get to talk with people regularly and um, get to know these people and like talk with them on the phone and I feel like I am I'm such a, like a small YouTuber obviously but just being able to become friends with these people uh, that has been very important to me um, so I, I think it's important I think you have to become friends with people that you would or I think that you should reach out to people that you actually would want to be friends with. Um, so if you were, for instance, like starting on YouTube, if you really love Wheezy Waiter, like reach out to Wheezy Waiter. Um, and, you know, some people will be really, really nice and kind of be receptive to, uh, like, having friendship or just, like, acquaintanceship. Uh, some people won't, but I think that it's important to try. Uh, like, for every... I would say, in my experience, like, you won't, not everybody will give a positive response, but that's okay. That's like life. If you were at a party, not everybody would want to talk with you. Okay. Here is a question. This is from my man, AJ Music Madness, who I think I'm going to meet in September, which is, like, coming up fast. We're going to, I'm going to be 
in Winston-Salem, I think September 8th through the 10th at the Bookmarks Book Festival. And if you guys are around, it's a really, really great festival. I think you would enjoy it a lot. I'll be giving a couple talks there if you would want to come by. So, AJ's Music Madness. Here's a question. I write a lot. How can I tell if what I'm writing is good and if I should stick with it? Or if I'm doing something wrong with my narrative and need to change? Well, when you're starting out writing, um, you can't compare the work you do today to like the best work that somebody else did and like after the editorial process at the peak of their career. That was something that was very hard for me to learn because when I was in high school, I know you're in high school, I, I would get like I would drive myself crazy because I wasn't writing a book that was as good at or a movie that was as good as like the best thing Stephen King or Steven Spielberg or Wes Anderson had ever done. And you're not going to be, like, great at first. And, but the most important thing when you're writing is you have to finish. Uh, you can't let... You can't get discouraged um, and let that make you not finish a project. There's a couple reasons for that. One, even if you write, like, a really bad story, and I don't mean that in a mean way, because, like, I wrote a lot of, like, stories that weren't that great, um, in the big picture, uh, but they were really important learning experiences, and you can only learn by doing, and it takes a lot of hours. Like, um, famously, Malcolm Gladwell has said that it takes about 10,000 hours to get, to get good at anything, and I found that to be true for me, um, and I still feel like I'm learning. Like, I, my next book, I think, is going to be a lot better than the end games, just because I learned from the end games so much. So definitely... You, you can't quit because of that reason. Um, and the second reason is that you don't want to get in your head like this psychological block that I don't finish things, you know, because that actually, that happens to a lot of people. Um, and it happened to me for a while, and you don't want that, that to become kind of part of your self-identity. It's like, as kind of like Dr. Philly as that might sound, it's, it's very true. Um, how can you tell if something is wrong with my, your narrative and needs to change? Hmm. You might know some people who have, um, like, the same taste as you, you know, like the same kind of things as you. Let's say, like, me in high school, my favorite writer was Stephen King or Nick Hornby. Well, I, I have friends who like those writers, and I would ask them to read my uh, stuff and say, like, what do you think about this or this? Does, does this need to change? Um... Like, should Michael, why isn't Michael telling everyone the truth at this point, or whatever? And you have to get with people whose uh, opinions you really respect, and uh, who has the same, these people who have the same taste as you, and I think that'll be very helpful for you. Um, yes, my next book is a fall 2014 title. I believe that is still true. I think it might be winter 2014. Um, I'm working on the book right now, and I think it's going to be, I don't want to jinx myself or, like, sound cocky or anything, but I think it's going to be good. I think it's going to be, like, significantly better than the end games, and so I really want to make sure, we all, like, and my agent and editor, we really want to make sure that we get it right. Um, so that should be, yeah, I would say, like, the latest it would be, it would be the end of 2014. Uh, and it is a phrase, so crash hot is a phrase, you're Australian, excellent. All right, hold on one second. This is from Lee Ann, my buddy Lee Ann. When creating Michael and Patrick, did you ever think of giving them different names? Because I know they're based off of you and your brother. Okay, yes, I did think of giving them different names. Um, because I thought that some people would think, man, this guy's really narcissistic, or, um, it, like, are these characters the author and his brother? And, I don't, like, they're really not me and my brother. They're, um, like, I am not as quick-thinking as the Michael in the book, and also, like, I don't have... 
they don't have as much like the you know I, I want to protect something extremely perfectly or anything like that. Um, they're just kind of loosely based on us, and mostly, honestly, the like the biggest thing that they were based on was just uh, like my own feeling of protection and love that I have for my real life little brother. Also, although I don't like say the word autism in the book, and it's certainly like up for the reader's in interpretation. I don't necessarily think my interpretation of the character or story is more valid than anybody else's. Um, which is something I learned in film school that has always stuck with me. And I think John Green also says that like books belong to their readers. But although the word autism is not in the book, uh, and you don't have to think this, but like I have a feeling, and some readers have too, that uh, the character is pr of Patrick is probably somewhere on the autistic spectrum. And I have a lot of like experience with uh, experiences with people with autism. I like volunteer for a little league that is for kids who have autism and other um, conditions, physical or psychological. Um, and I also have like relatives who are autistic. So I think that the Patrick in the book is probably somewhere on the autism spectrum. But my brother is like not. He's 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 not autistic. He's um, he's not. So there, there are a lot of like big differences between us and the characters. And I did think about changing their names. And when I got my agent, I said, Joe, who is my agent, do you feel like we should change their names? Because I don't want people to be distracted or think it's weird. And she said, no, I think it's cool. And when I sold the book, I said to my editor, Donna, Donna, do you think we should change the names? Because I don't want people to think it's distracting or weird. And she said, no, I think it's cool. So that's a very good question. Okay, Elliot's George Edwards, who introduced me to David Bowie. Do you have a list of story ideas or concepts written down? And if so, how big is the list? I do have a list. I wrote it on the back of a postage stamp, and that is how big it is. No, I, um, it's, I do have a list. Um, I've got a, I've got book two, which was a story idea that I'd had for, like, a long time, a few years, but I finally like nailed down the story in the last few months. Um, I've got another screenplay that I'm working on that is like, it's, um, I don't want to say too much about it. Uh, it's an original story. It's not based on the end games or my next book, but it's, uh, it has to do with ghosts, but it's a new, it's a totally different kind of ghost story. I'm really excited about it. And it, Hopefully, you guys, you guys will be able to. I'll be able to share more information with you in the next few months, for reasons I cannot describe. Um, and I have a list of story ideas. Um, I, I honestly don't have that many story ideas like into the future. I've got book two. I've got the screenplay, which I also might write as a book, depending on how things go. Um, I've got. Another story for a screenplay. I've got a bunch of short story ideas, so I probably have uh, in all about six or seven concepts that I'm working away on. Uh, thanks for loving my name. I got married last year, so it's actually not my name anymore, but I use it anyway. As you should. You should. It's awesome. Um, I got married four years ago, and T. Michael Martin is still my name, so I use it anyway. Um, I have a friend uh, who got married, and she took her husband's name, but she doesn't use it. She uses her maiden name as her pen name, and it's a really cool maiden name, so I understand why. I probably shouldn't say who it is, though. Uh, when did I first start writing The End Games? Where did you start? Uh, I first started writing it in September of 2008, September 4th, 2008, and I actually turned it in almost... To, to Harper Collins, I turned in the final, final draft almost four years to the day. It was like September 7th, 2012. Um, where did I start it? I started it in my uh, bedroom. I was living with my parents for like a year before I got married, after between like marriage and college, because my wife lived nearby, my then fiance lived nearby. 
Uh, so I started at my parents' house, and I finished it in, I finished the first, like, the draft that got me an agent in my apartment in Winston-Salem, and I finished the book final version in my apartment in Morgantown, West Virginia, and uh, that is that is what's up. All right, you guys, this is the last call. If you would like me to answer your question, or would, if you would like to have a phone call with me, go ahead and send the email to T. Michael Martin Books at the Gmail dot com. All right. When did your I, uh, Leanne again is asking a really good question. Um, when you write it, when you're when I'm writing my books, or maybe just short stories, where do I often get my ideas from? It's usually two things, actually. Um, people always talk about, like in Hollywood, they say you have to have like a, a great concept for a story. Um, so. But I actually think that you need two concepts. Like, I don't think that having just one really good concept is enough. So with the end games, there, I had two concepts. The, the first one was, what if there was this um, apocalypse, the zombie apocalypse, and this 17-year-old kid had to take care of his possibly special needs five-year-old brother? That's one part of it. And the other part is, what if when he meets the survivors, he has to continue this lie um, and it becomes this kind of like Jacob the Liar, which is a really great book and like not a wonderful film, but it's still a pretty good film. Uh, this get Jacob the Liar thing where he has to keep weaving this elaborate fantasy and the people he likes and loves keep getting put in danger because of that. So that was like the two ideas. Um, and I don't know where those ideas come from. Uh, sometimes, honestly, like it seems to be that I'm, I get most of my ideas when I'm about to fall asleep, like, um, I was about to fall asleep in 2008, and I thought the first line of the end games came into my head. It was, uh, originally it said, he awoke in the dark to the screams again. And th that changed to Michael awoke in the dark to the screams again. And then I just, like, knew what the book was going to be about right then. And then recently, like in February, I was having a really hard time with one aspect of the plot in my next book, and I was falling asleep, and I just sat up, like, boom, and I just said, blah, 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 blah. And my wife was like, what does that mean? And I said, I, I just, it means blah, 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 blah. I figured it out. So she was excited once she got done being annoyed with me for startling her. All right. Um, okay. Claire, you're going to miss me in New Mexico this year. I'm going to miss you guys, too. I really wish that I uh, could come to New Mexico. I, go to the, I went to this thing called the Glen Workshop last year, which was really an amazing experience. Um, but I won't be able to go this year because I'm going to VidCon um, at the same time. But I am, like, as excited to go to VidCon as I am sad to not be able to go to the Glen. And next year, I think I'll be able to go, because it'll be, VidCon will be held at a different time. Okay. Um, out of curiosity, when I saw you... Oh, curiosity struck me when I saw your name. What does the T stand for? It stands for totally. No. It stands for Thomas. And the reason I didn't use just, like, Mike Martin or Michael Martin, I used T. Michael Martin, was because... There was already a Michael Martin um, in the Writers Guild, which is like a screenwriting thing, and I believe it was the case, I don't know if it still is, but it, it was at one time, you couldn't have the same name as somebody else in the Writers Guild, like you couldn't have the same pen name. So <clears throat> I was like, well, what am I going to do? And I didn't want to, I didn't want to like make up a name, and my first name is Thomas, although I've always been gone by Michael, um, or Mike. So yeah, I just decided to use T. Really want to make sure I get everybody's questions. Um, if you're starting out on YouTube, do you do you have any advice for people starting out on YouTube? Yeah, I kind of feel like not very qualified to answer any questions about YouTube. Um, 
I really love doing it, but I feel like I'm like still learning so, so much about how to do it and how to do it well. And there are people who have been doing this for like seven years. Um, so I kind of feel like, I feel a little strange like giving advice, but um, I think the most important thing is like just make stuff you genuinely like and uh, reach out to people you genuinely like. Maybe don't reach out to Smosh because um, like Smosh probably gets 2,000 emails or something a day. But if, you know, somebody you like who is um, like not the most famous person in the world on YouTube, reach out to them and see, you know, just ask them like, how did you get started? Do you have any advice? Um, or don't ask them right away, like, please check out my channel. Uh, I think that that's, in general, like, don't do that if you're trying to become friends with somebody because that just, uh, it's, not, it's not polite. It's not polite and people would probably not be very receptive. Um, let's see, any questions? YouTube, any advice for writers? Um, was there an inspiration for Captain Joe Peck? Yes, there was. Uh, there was, a, like, I knew this one guy who was, like, the most physically intimidating guy I'd ever met. I used to work at a physical therapy clinic, and he came in. He was, like, a, a strong man. You know, those guys that, like, lift cars and stuff. Uh, he did that for fun. And he was, like, he was, like, a very sweet person, but he was the most physically intimidating man I'd ever met. Uh, so he was based on, Joe Peck was based on his physical uh, self, uh, and the uh, and Joe Peck was also based on two other guys that I had known at different points in my life, adult men who were like incredibly charming and um, had this kind of like good old boy shucks, what do I know um, charm about them. But they also like there was something slightly off, like you I, you couldn't always tell, but there was like something where there just seemed to be a sharp edge under everything they said. And if you said to somebody else, like, do you notice that? Did you notice how that guy's kind of weird? They would maybe not even notice it because the person was otherwise so charming. Uh, so that's who Joe Peck was based on. I'm not going to give any names because I don't want to get beat up. Um, do I have any advice on how to create, uh, I think it was interesting, likable characters? I think that... What makes a character interesting is um, kind of their contradictions, like the contradictions in different parts of their personality. Um, because I think that's what makes people interesting. I think we have ambitions of who we want to be, and then we have kind of the grind of who we mostly are during the day-to-day. -day. And I feel like there's that gap between those two things that is really like our humanity. I feel like that is what a person is. And I don't mean that in like a negative or fatalistic way, but I think that it's we're most interesting in the contradictions in our personality. Um, I uh, and I, I think that it's not as important that a character is likable as it is that they're understandable. People don't necessarily. Let me put it this way: There's a difference between sympathy and empathy. Sympathy is when you like a character, like Tom Hanks or somebody. You're like, oh, I really like that guy. But empathy is more important than that. Empathy is when you say, I understand that guy, and I feel like I am like him in some ways, or girl. So let's say Harry Potter is a character who is both sympathetic and empathetic. And someone like um, Macbeth, he's not a likable guy. Like, Hamlet is not a likable guy. Um, Walter White on Breaking Bad becomes a very unlikable man. But we understand them. And, like, with Macbeth, he does terrible things, but he feels really bad about them. And he asks himself, why do I do these terrible things? And because of that, we think, ah, oh, he's just like me. Um, 
I feel bad when I do bad things. I don't understand why I do bad things. I feel bad before I do them for thinking about them. I feel awful when I'm doing them, and afterwards there is no end to my guilt. So we understand. Um, it, it's not as important that we like, like the character as we understand them, and we see their humanity. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what's really important. Um, I, and I also think that it's important to know that a character is really revealed not through what they say about themselves, not through what they wear, not through their um, like wit or lack thereof. A character is what they do under pressure. A character is revealed and created in the moment when they have two irreconcilable goods or irreconcilable bads, and they have to make a, a decision under pressure to go one way or the other, and that is interesting. Like that is when a person, that is like the heart of a character. Everything else is kind of like window dressing or characterization, but that is really the heart of the character, and it's also the heart of the story and thematic journey. Journey. Um, how do I come up with a truly original plot? I'll get back to that. I'm going to answer a couple comments really fast. Existential John, that's <laughs> a good name. I like that. I'm semi-existential Mike. Glad to meet you. Uh, when I write sometimes, I notice that over time the story changes and evolves to a completely different story. Has that ever happened to you? Yeah. I mean, um, it's kind of different for me because I spend most of my time plotting out a story. Like, it took me almost a year and a half to write a the story for the end games because it's... I don't know if you've read it, but it's like a story that revolves on very deliberately paced reveals to the character and to the audience, and I really like that. Like, I like um, getting into, like, the nitty-gritty, and that allows you to do really interesting things if you really consider each part of the story. But your story is, like, going to change over the course of time um, because you're going to think, what if in the last hundred pages he did this? This is actually much more interesting than what I had. But if he does that then, then at the beginning he has to do this other thing. Uh, and then if he does that thing in the beginning, that changes who he is in the middle. So he probably wouldn't do this thing. Like, that is, that is the creative process. Um, so, yeah, don't feel really badly about that. But uh, it helps me very, very much to plot out stories in advance. Um, are you really hard on yourself as an artist? If so, how do you personally overcome that? Yeah, I am. I'm pretty hard on myself, but I'm getting better at not being so hard on myself. Um, and the way I do that is you really have to figure out, and this is something I've learned, like, I, I'd always kind of intellectually thought this, but I emotionally have really learned it in the last just few months. Um, you really have to know whose respect you want. Like, who do you want to respect you? Because if your goal is to just be liked by as many people as possible, that's a really frustrating thing to do. I mean, John Green has talked about this. I think the example he gave was, like, Lindsay Lohan. Like, many, many, many more people know who Lindsay Lohan is than know who, like, even someone like John Green or Marcus Zusak. Like, I think those guys are kind of geniuses. Um, but I, don't, I wouldn't want to be Lindsay Lohan. Um, and I don't really care if... Um, and uh, it sounds like I'm criticizing Lindsay Lohan really terribly. I like I I'm not. I, what I mean is that you shouldn't be like a, as obsessed with how many people like you as do the people who you really respect. Do they respect what you do as well? Like that's very important. Um, and that helps a lot because like when you get kind of become a professional artist or writer or filmmaker, like whatever it is that you end up doing. Um, it's like, obviously it's really easy for people to, and they have like every right in the world to just hate what you do and let you know about it. Um, but the fact that people like Sarah Zar, John Green, R.L. Stein, like these people who are my creative heroes, the fact that they really like the book, that, that is very important to me. Um, and that's, that, that is very important to me because... Those are the people whose respect I want. And, on, and, you know, people like you guys, like, everybody... I don't even mind um, getting 
bad reviews as long as they're civil and thoughtful because those are very helpful. Um, but, you know, you can't be too hard on yourself because, and I, again, I think like the most important thing is you can't compare the work you do today to the best work somebody else did at the peak of their career. Like if I read, if I read what I wrote today in my notebook and I go try to compare it to like I am the messenger or the book thief, um, I would just go crazy. That's impossible. It's not nearly as good and it's not supposed to be. So that's, that's important. Just know who you, whose respect you really want. Okay, um, I feel like I, I'm, I should be winding down. So I, if you guys have any last questions, I don't want to keep everybody. We've already been here almost an hour. It's really gone by fast for me. Um, go ahead and email me. If you want me to call, it's uh, 336. Oh my god, I almost gave you my phone number. Uh, just email me at tmichaelmartinbooks at gmail.com. Uh, if not, I'll go ahead and answer this last question that was submitted. Um, how do you suggest coming up with a truly original plot for a story? Here is how I suggest that. It's not that... Originality happens when you love the genre you're in and study the genre you're in and get to know the genre as well as anybody in the audience. Because what you'll realize as you're like studying the genre, watching every movie in the genre, like reading every book you can in the genre, what you're going to see is that there are common elements in all of those stories. And that's because people love that stuff. Like, it's not because it's not original. It's because that is what, that's part of what they read the book in that genre to experience. Um, and so once you see that there are these, like, pillars in every zombie story, for instance, you realize what the audience wants from that, those kind of stories, and you can give it to them in ways they would never predict, hopefully never predict. Uh, and that is really what originality is. It's not, almost every time um, someone says, like, we're going to reinvent the superhero movie, those are usually not very good movies um, because they don't, like, show a kind of respect or reverence or love for um, the superhero genre. Um, and, that, and that just turns off, like, the superhero fans. Uh, so you really have to study your genre, figure out what the audience wants. I'll give you an example. When I was writing The End Games and I was plotting out the story, I realized that in almost every zombie story, there was this moment in the story that I called the last perimeter is breached, when the last defense for the heroes is down. There's nowhere left to run. And a lot of times, in fact, almost every time. That was a physical barrier. Um, and 28 days later is when they, uh, the monsters get through the wall into the, um, that military installation. In uh, Dawn of the Dead, it's the original Dawn of the Dead, it's that moment when the, the like, biker raider gang, they come in and they like break into the mall. In Night of the Living Dead, it's when the zombies finally get through the boarded up windows. And so what is interesting about that is that, like, the audience wants that moment. Like, that's part of what they love about zombie stories. So I thought, is there any way I can do that, but in a way that is not necessarily just a physical barrier falling? In the end games, a physical barrier does fall. But it doesn't happen two-thirds of the way through the story or three-fourths of the way through the story like it usually does. It happens just over halfway through the story, when the last of the uh, perimeter fences around the capitals, around the Capitol building fall. But I, I, I wanted to, like, surprise the audience if I could. And I, I think, like, they, it surprised a lot of people. I, I don't know, like, what percentage, but, I, like, a lot of people have said that the book was very surprising, so this is maybe part of it. Um, in, instead of having it just be a physical barrier, I thought, wouldn't it be interesting if halfway through 
the reason the protagonist can't run anymore is he's infected himself. There's no way to escape that. Um, and once I thought that, it was like, well, how do I set that up so it's not just, um, he got bitten here, and uh, that's something, like, that is how we know he's infected. I, I wanted it to be something that was planted a little bit earlier, and uh, that's where, like, the uh, the coal miner bellow in the in the church came in. And, you know, once I had that, I had to rearrange some other things. So that's really what an original plot is, I think. So, yeah, that is my answer to that. I hope that that is helpful. Um, okay, I will give you guys just, like, a few seconds. If you have any um, more questions, please feel free to ask. I really, really do appreciate everyone coming in. Um, a couple last things. Um, if you enjoy the book, I hope that you will consider um, leaving it a positive review on Amazon or Goodreads, uh, because that is, like, super helpful. It helps people to decide if they want to buy the book or not or check it out from the library or whatever. Um, and uh, the other thing is, if you... And this is, like, not related but to it. Like, you don't have to leave me a good review in order to do this. Um, send me an email to tmichaelmartinbooks at gmail.com uh, with your physical address if you would like. And just as a thank you for coming in and watching this live show, I will send you a manuscript page just um, from the original manuscript of the End Games. I wrote most of it on in hand uh, or by hand, and I also wrote some uh, on my typewriter. Uh, if you have not only do that if you haven't already received them, because I know a couple of you guys have already received them from the giveaway I did a couple months ago. But yeah, um, I think that's it. Uh, I really do appreciate you guys coming. And uh, this will be up... This... Um, this will be available later on my YouTube channel if you would like to see it. I will wait about 30 seconds just to make sure the shirts are awesome. Oh, yeah, I'm sure you guys probably know. Um, like, I have those Hill Valley Hoverboard shirts in DFTBA, at DFTBA.com, which is really exciting. I'm so excited. I don't know. I really didn't expect um, that to be able to happen, so that's exciting. Okay, I think that is about it. So... Thank you guys very much for coming. This was really, really fun. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Thanks for watching.